Tonight's broadcast of This Land Rural Stories on Stage is sponsored in part by AARP Vermont and the Vermont Community Foundation. Good evening, and welcome to Rural Stories on Stage, live at the Chandler for the Center for the Arts here in Randolph. I am Jane Lindholm. I'm so pleased to be here, and I'm so pleased to be joined by all of you tonight in what I hope will be an evening of connection and reflection and some really wonderful storytelling. So thank you all for being here tonight. What a pleasure to be with you. Those of us who call this state home are Vermonters, but we come to that identity in myriad ways and with divergent and intertwining life stories. Tonight we're going to hear from five Vermonters whose stories illuminate the challenges and joys of living in Vermont. And we all have those, don't we? Both challenges and joys, and not always in equal measure. And we've crafted this evening to highlight both the challenges and the joys, because for many of us, there are things we cherish about our lives here, and ways we really want to make Vermont better, stronger. Our storytellers come from the local community around here. One owns a general store, one works in a local school, one is trying to build an old hill farm and bring it back to life. One is working in manufacturing, leading a company that supplies jobs to the region, and one is still trying to figure out what her life here holds for her. Some have lived here their whole lives, others grew up here and came back, and all have made Vermont home by choice and not always the easiest choice. They're going to share their stories with you tonight, and I think I'll have a chance to ask each of them some questions that dive into what they have told us in their stories. This is all part of VPR and Vermont PBS's collaboration called This Land. It's a project exploring the changing story of rural Vermont and what it's like to live here, as well as what the future might hold for the next generation of Vermonters. The collaboration includes an extensive survey that polled 800 Vermonters on the issues important to them, a documentary series on Vermont PBS, many reported series on uh, VPR and Vermont edition conversations, and of course this evening tonight, in some ways a culmination of all of the hard work that has gone into this project. Our first storyteller tonight is Morgan Easton. Morgan is rooted in this community. Those deep ties support and connect her. But knowing everyone in town comes with its own tension, too. A young adult, Morgan is the kind of person Vermont policymakers say they want to keep here. But it's not always easy to stay. Please welcome Morgan Easton. I grew up here. My mother grew up here. My grandmother grew up here. My great-grandfather was the barber in town. I was supposed to graduate high school in 2010. I was really engaged in my community growing up, but I wasn't so engaged in my education. In my senior year of high school, my parents allowed me the opportunity to host an exchange student, hoping that that would compel me to graduate high school on time. But I still managed to skate under the radar my senior year. I was literally skateboarding. I Remember graduation day, I uh, was skateboarding in town as my peers prepared to walk across the stage and share their plans for the future. I did manage to get to the school for the ceremony, and I took the opportunity to reflect in my own way. I skateboarded through the empty hallways and passed my hands over the classrooms I managed to avoid entering over four years. And I stood in the back of the tent, and I hoped no one would ask me why I wasn't on the stage. I ended up getting called on stage, though, to participate in the exchange of flags with my exchange student. So I joined her on stage in my sweaty t-shirt and my shorts and in front of a sea of my classmates in cap and gown. And I remember having a hard time seeing who was in the audience through my tears of embarrassment. So after that, I was done with school, but I wasn't really done with high school. I just worked in landscaping and childcare and did some traveling, but I always came back. And 
Um, there's something about coming home to Vermont where so many people come to visit. Um, I just, there's a feeling that can't really be described. So in 2012, I finished school and I wanted to do more for my community. I didn't really know what capacity I'd be able to do so and I didn't really know what sort of opportunities I should pursue. So in January 2013, I wandered up to the local college, Vermont Tech, and I enrolled in an, a math and English class. I started to get a feel for higher education and found a program that I really loved and graduated in 2018 in, uh, with a degree in architectural engineering technology and sustainable design. I... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I did a lot at VTC. I was really involved. I and I still managed to double my GPA from high school. So there's <laughs> yeah, there's only 4 points in a GPA and I wasn't a high honor student at VTC. So um <laughs> But the biggest honor when I was in school was serving on the Vermont State College's Board of Trustees. I represented the student population across the five state colleges. And that was a really unique opportunity to have in college. I think it really solidified my passion for involvement. So I graduated and uh, I knew through school I really appreciated being close enough to my community to work and play. and. Um, be close to my family, and so I took a job with an architect in Montpelier. We did some really great residential and um, community projects, and he couldn't keep me on through the winter, so I took a job in West Lebanon doing high-end residential design work. Um, and, you know, it was 40 hours a week, small company, benefits, um, good offices, uh, but it wasn't the job for me. I gave them my notice in the spring and felt a sense of relief I really didn't expect. I came back to my community to work in landscaping and with the local solar company and coaching youth mountain biking and serving on various committees and working on community projects. There's a stigma about living in your hometown in your 20s and I don't mind, I love it here. I love skiing and biking out my door. I love joining my grandparents for lunch in the middle of the week and watching my nieces grow in the community that I and my mother and my grandmother grew up in. I even love being mistaken for my mother at the hardware store. Um, <laughs> so either she's aged really well or I haven't. Um, so what if I have to piece together work to stay close to my community? What do you call a Vermonter with two jobs? Lazy. Thank you, Morgan. What a pleasure to talk with you tonight. Thank you. So, you know, it's interesting. Finishing school was hard for you in some ways, but the idea of service to others, you never questioned. It wasn't about hard work. It was something else in school. And you wanted to stay in your community and work to make it better. And it sounds like your parents instilled that in you. Why was that such a strong urge and why does it remain such a strong urge? Uh, I guess I realized it was a strong urge when I was working with the state college board and I would gather the other student leaders from the other colleges. And one of the um, students from CCV, she really admired that I had been in the same community and I watched families grow and people age and knew people for over 20 years. And that was something that not a lot of people have the ability to experience. So that was, rang really true to me. And you know, sometimes young people in their 20s, and I can certainly remember for me, you see your friends having experiences that are different from yours and there's that pang of, oh, I wish I could be doing that. But it sounds like you also get a lot of fulfillment from being in a small town and being in a small community and having those connections. If you were talking to one of your friends from high school who was saying, boy, it seems like your life is boring, how would you come back at that? That happens all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've been here. Um, it took me three years to start college, so by the time 
I was starting school. A lot of my friends were starting master's programs. Um, and they kind of would come back and tell me about everything they were doing as if I wasn't doing anything at all. So now it's five years later, 10 years out of high school, and they realize that there is a lot here. And I'm enjoying myself, and there's a lot I have going on. I'm fairly busy around these parts. There's a lot to do. <laughs> Are they starting to be jealous of you and maybe coming back? Um, I think they just admire it. There's not as much jealousy as there is admiration for appreciating the place that they grew up in, whether or not they've decided to come back and stay. One of the ways that you found yourself in college was you, you say you kind of wandered over to Vermont Technical College and, you know, a little bit unsure of what you wanted to do or who you wanted to become. And it's fortunate in some ways that VTC was right there, you know, that it's in your neighborhood. And that is one of the challenges of living in Vermont, is that those opportunities aren't always in your backyard, aren't always there. Do you think that's a problem for the state? Yeah, I mean, there's even folks in this town that I know could benefit from wandering up to VTC just in the same way I did. But it can be difficult for them to even get up to the college five miles up the road because they may not have transportation, um, but they could really benefit from the opportunities offered up there just as I did. So even within such a close proximity, there is that issue. You have student loans? Yes, yes. I, I have a lot less than a lot of my friends would have from going out of state, um, but it's you know something I've just taken the time to learn financial literacy for myself because I feel like some people in my generation, a lot of us missed that in our earlier education. I actually really just skipped it. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> the, um, yeah, just getting a better understanding of that and, you know, to cry about the, the state of the affordability in Vermont, um, you first have to take responsibility for yourself and really understand what, what you have to deal with in your own financial life before you can say that the financial state of things is not acceptable. So, take, yeah. So yeah. I started with me first, and now I you know, can talk to more people my age a little more knowledgeably about how they can take steps to really make this an affordable home for them. Do you have health insurance? No, I don't. I turned 26 in the fall, and so I was still riding on my mother's health insurance, and I had that job I thought I'd have benefits for, so, um, you know, I'm nearing the time that I need to figure it out, and that's another hard part of, you know, trying to make a living in so many different ways. So the last question I want to ask you is, aside from the hallways of your high school, where's the best place around here to skateboard? Oh. <laughs> Well, it used to be the old Ethan Allen plant where there was two big concrete pads at different levels. That was actually where I spent the day of graduation. <laughs> um, and we had some pretty cool features built there, so rest but in you, peace, Ethan yeah, Allen. Yeah, it used to be. Now where do you go? I don't really skateboard anymore, I actually. <laughs> I do a lot of mountain biking and cross-country skiing around here, and the trail networks that have existed for years are really great, and they're just growing, so there's a lot to do. It's wonderful. Well, Morgan Easton, thank you very much for sharing your story with us and telling us about your life. I appreciate it. Thank you. So Morgan has decided to stay here to nurture those roots that her great-grandmother, her grandmother, her parents nurtured. I think her grandmother is even here tonight. Is she here? I'm glad. But Morgan's at the beginning of her journey of figuring out how to make this life work in Vermont. Will Gilman is a little further along in that journey. He too has chosen to trace the arc of his life here in Vermont. Those who live in this area probably get their groceries and catch up with their neighbors at Will's store in Chelsea. And they probably know Will as well. He lives right upstairs. Please join me in welcoming Will Gilman to the stage. Hello. Hello. <laughs> These nice folks have given me five minutes to talk about my three favorite subjects. Me, 
my store and my hometown of Chelsea. And they probably have told you I lived in Chelsea my entire life so far. Um, Chelsea's the shire town of Orange County, and it's a pretty nice place. Back in September of 1976, when I was a junior at UVM, I had a motorcycle accident, which resulted in a broken neck and a severed spinal cord at the C4 level. I spent four months in the old Mary Hitchcock Hospital and, uh, and down in Hanover, and then went for almost six months of rehab out at Craig Hospital in Denver, Colorado. Eventually, I returned to UVM, graduated with my degree in accounting. I next studied for and passed the CPA exam, but even with the help of Oak Rehab, I was unable to find a job. So after about a year of trying, I decided the best thing that I could do was to hire myself. There was a local store in town that Fred Dickinson owned. It was an old-time drug store. And I attempted to purchase that, but the bank wouldn't loan me the money. So a year later, I found three local individuals who would local, loan me the money. And in September of 1985, I bought the store from Fred, who had been running it for 41 years. Now, the store for many years has sold what you'd find in an old drug stores, candy, tobacco, greeting cards, toys, gifts. It also had more things that you'd find in a convenience store, beer and soda. And we still sell all of those things. And we still use the same machine to make our wonderful homemade ice cream that Fred bought new back in the spring of 1945. Now, my job as a storekeeper is to provide whatever the local community wants. That requires listening to their wants and needs and being adaptable. And in that regard, we now sell more groceries than we ever sold. We're the biggest grocery store in about a 12-mile radius. So we've changed considerably in the last five years. Now, back uh, when I was 20 years old and in the hospital, I was very ill and very near death several times. My main focus was just staying alive and wanting to get home. Eventually, my big day came. My mom and her sister flew out to Denver, Colorado, and we caught a flight back to Logan Airport in Boston. Hoyt Batty knew his way around Boston, so he drove my dad down to meet us, and my brother and a friend, Will Dodge, drove a borrowed van down to bring me and all my gear back home. They expected I'd be pretty tired after that long flight from Denver, so they laid a piece of foam in the back of the van to lay me on for the trip home. And we headed for Chelsea. After we'd gone around in a circle two or three times, <laughs> they decided to pull over to recalculate. And eventually, we did get out of Boston. <laughs> about an hour later than planned. So we arrived in Chelsea about 10.30 at night. And as we were getting close to the village, I began to think this was bloody anticlimactic. I've been trying to get home for 10 months, and here I was coming home late at night, and nobody was going to know I was finally getting home, and no one was going to be there to greet me. So I asked my brother if he would lay on the horn as we entered the village. <laughs> it's about a, a mile ride from the end of the village to our house. And just about the time he started tooting on the horn, I started hearing car horns tooting and saw a light shining through the windows of the van. It turned out a friend of my mom's had spread the word that I was coming home. And a large number of people had gathered lying the road in their cars, waiting for my arrival. So when we got to our house, and they got me out and set me up in my wheelchair, there was a parade of cars going by, tooting horns and waving, and people broadcasting over their CB radios, welcoming me home. Some of them stopped and wished me well. About midnight, I finally got in the house. I still have a picture of my brother 
wheeling me up the ramp. I had a grin from ear to ear. I wish everyone could have one day in their life that they were as happy as I was that day. Several years later, I was chatting with a friend, Brad Brownell, and he mentioned that he'd been working in Fred's store that Friday night that I came home. He said he noticed a lot of people in cars gathering out on the street, but he said, but it was eerily quiet out there. So he asked somebody, what's up? And they said, Willie's coming home. That night in July that I came home was 42 years ago, and I'm home still. Thank you. Can you still conjure that feeling, Will, of what oh, it felt like to see all those people? I have people? trouble not getting choked up. I get choked up, and it didn't even happen to me. <laughs> I love that what you say about that night is that you wish everyone could have a day where they feel that happy. Do you think most people don't? I really don't know. It was a pretty special moment. Mm. You know, anyone driving through Chelsea today admiring its two village greens and big brick buildings and they might look at this pastoral landscape and think nothing really has changed in this community, uh, no different than maybe as it was when you were growing up. Has it changed? Yes, it, it has changed a lot. I mean, it was much more a farming town when I grew up, but my dad was a milk hauler back with the days of milk cans, and there was a lot of little bitty farms, a lot of older men, only milk six or ten cows. And when the bulk tanks came in in the mid-60s, they were gone practically overnight. So even when I graduated high school, I think there were somewhere around 25 operating farms. There's four now. And the granite quarries was a big employer when I was a boy. And hardly anybody works at the granite quarries. I'm sure 20 or 30 men must have gone to bury every day to work in the granite quarries. So it is... It's changed in that way a lot. How does that change the way the community feels? I think it's, it's not a large change, but people drive further away to work now. Barry was, you know, it's 20 minutes to the quarries. Now they drive an hour. So when they came home before, they might be a little more ready to get right involved in something going on. But now they drive an hour, an hour and a half to get back home, some of them. There's still a lot that work closer by, but I think the further you drive away, the less you're going to be involved in things that are going on at home, because you're tired when you get home. You think that number of people would still come out for someone coming home today like you did? I hope so. I don't know, but I hope so. It sounds like your store is doing pretty well. It is now, yes. Wasn't for a while? It, it struggled for a long time. It did very well. I mean, it did okay for the first 15 years or so that I owned it. And the state made some changes and some tax laws, and it made it very difficult for a lot of small stores to stay in business. Yeah. I'm flourishing now because several others didn't stay in business, and that has opened the door up for me. That's why I'm a grocery store now, because of the changes that happened. What do you think could or should be done, or should anything be done to help ensure that small stores, whether they're general stores that only have a few things or, or stores where you can buy your groceries in a small community, stay vibrant? I mean, is it important enough that there should be more done to keep these, these fixtures in their communities? I'm not a big fan of government involvement. I think people need to really keep it in mind that when they want something in five minutes to run to the store and get it is nice but that means they also need to go other times or the store won't be there when they want it. They need to commit, just like many other things, they need to commit local if they want the local to be there when they want it. Hard to do, though, when you're driving an hour to get to work and you've got yes. a big box store there and maybe you're getting home late and hours might be you know, not, not in line with what your general store can provide. Yes, I think it's a, it's a sacrifice that they have to make. If they want the store to be there when they want it, they have to sacrifice some other times, too. Are you an extrovert? No. 
How do you run a store and be such a part of your community for so long? I mean, I would be exhausted every night if I had to interact with so many people in my town and, and be such a visible and well-known part of my community. Well, first of all, I'm very comfortable where I am. I know most everyone very well. And I just love chatting with people. As they will tell you, I chat way too much. <laughs> I love stories. My dad was a storyteller. I come by it naturally. So, You know, a lot of communities are dealing with school consolidation. Uh, a couple of towns in Addison County are going to be thinking about that this week and whether to close their small schools. It's something that this area has gone through, too. And I understand that a couple of years ago, Chelsea closed its high school. Um, and the 9th through 12th grade students now attend a number of other schools. What yes. has that been like, do you think, from your perspective? I... My own mind is that the, the biggest impact will be 10, 20 years from now. But in the short run, it's impacted the folks who have kids in school most directly. That They now need to go 20 miles away to watch a soccer game or even further and to be involved with their kids in school. For the other local people, they don't get to go see them as often, particularly basketball. That's... In Vermont, that's the big sport in the wintertime. I mean, when I was in high school, as a freshman, I think our team had lost over a two-year span, 30-something games in a row. In a row. <laughs> but when you went to a basketball game, the gym was full. There were three or 400 people there. It didn't matter. They went to cheer the kids on and to see each other. And over time, that will be lost. People won't know each other as well because there's not a reason to come together to see each other. Just the five minutes of saying hi and how are you doing. Is there anything that you see in your local community that is actually building the connections? I mean, it, there's a lot that, that we talk about that's taken away community or taken away connections. And yet, you know, when you ask people, are they happy in Vermont? They have challenges, but but a lot of people are really still committed to where they live and who they live with and making Vermont strong. What do you see as building community around here? Yeah, there's a group that run the farmer's market in the summer every Friday and that has become extremely popular. A lot of people come and they have music so people don't come just to buy some vegetables. They come for the two or three hours they'll stay and that has been a good source. And there's a local arts council that's worked very hard to help promote things. The thing that I see different is that people are having to work now to, to make it stay a community, where in the past it was a natural thing. And that's what I'm afraid is over time, the effort that it takes to, to keep it going may fail. That's what I'm afraid of. Do you have any advice for Morgan? who's our youngest storyteller tonight and who is figuring out you know, how, to, how to make a life work in this community, working many jobs and feeling so connected and, and the power of being in your home. Well, my advice to most anyone, especially if they're new in any community, is to get involved. Find out what organizations are out there. They're always looking for help, young help, and get involved. It's the way you meet your friends and neighbors, it's the way to make contacts and to make you really feel like it's your home, is to get involved. Well, Will Gilman, it's been a pleasure to hear from you tonight. Your story, I mean, just, I think, probably gave everybody the tingles. And then a wonderful opportunity to talk to you about the life you've had here and what you've seen. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's no secret that Vermonters are proud of our working landscape. From the earliest Vermonters, the Native Americans who settled here, and the Abenaki who still trace their lineage back before colonial settlements changed the landscape, through to European colonists who found the land rocky and difficult, but worth the effort or at least impossible to extricate themselves from once they'd started. Or maybe, you know, just this tension that we still feel today between development and the natural landscape, and this uneasy balance. Through it all, the land has been one of the ways that Vermonters stay connected to where we are and who we are, and how we differentiate ourselves from other places. Our next guest feels that connection to the land and the landscape deeply. 
he also experiences the difficulties of trying to work the land and make a living. For the last three years, Ray Hull has been working to bring his own piece of land back to life. But whether or not he'll ultimately succeed remains to be seen. I'd like to invite Ray Hull to the stage. Good evening. Um, I was born here in Randolph. I grew up in Redding, Vermont, on the backside of the Coolidge State Forest, where mountains and hillside farms were part of the landscape. And that's just the way I liked it as a kid. When I was 12, I went to work for our local dairy farm in town and suddenly realized I liked that too, milking cows and farming. I was 16 when my family moved to Michigan. We first arrived in Michigan, the first thing I noticed were there were no mountains, and it was flat land. That was something that was hard for me to get used to. I guess you can take the boy out of the mountains, but you can't take the mountains out of the boy. After that, um, I decided in 2015 to return to Vermont in hopes of resurrecting a hillside farm that's my aunt's here in Braintree where I now live. I kind of consider people like me who have grown up here, moved away, and then returned, we're kind of like salmon. From the big waters, we head up to the rivers from where we first came. While I was in Michigan, I finished high school, went off to college, started out in engineering, and decided to shift gears into dairy science. I eventually graduated from Michigan State University. After college, I went to work for a couple of different dairy farms as a herdsman, until eventually I bought my own farm. I was married at the time, and my daughter was two. My son was on his way, but not born as of then. And I came to the realization that maybe working the seven days a week was just not going to get it anymore. So I decided to sell the farm. That was a very difficult decision for me at that time. After that, I got into the machine tool industry. I went to work for my dad. Eventually, my dad and I, we opened up our own machine tool company and did this for several years until we started seeing a declining trend in our segment of that industry. My dad was getting up there in years and decided that maybe we ought to get out of it. So we did. A couple days after that decision was made, he came up to me and he asked me, what do you think you might do after this? And I said, well, I'd like to move back to Vermont, maybe resurrect my aunt's farm. So I looked right at him and I asked him, do you think I'm crazy? He said, no, not at all. My friends, on the other hand, they had a completely different take on this whole moving to Vermont thing. Some of the comments were, don't they get a lot of snow out there? Or, Ray, have you bumped your head? And I, I think my favorite one was, oh, I think I should take you to therapy immediately. <laughs> so here I am, trying to decide whether I should move back to Vermont, especially at this stage of my life. So here I am, trying to resurrect a hillside farm with the hopes of selling more hay cattle and lumber products eventually. I wanted to prove myself right rather than wrong and the simple fact that does a rural farm here in Vermont become just part of a larger agricultural operation or does a rural farm become just another countryside estate? I don't know. These mountains are the same. The peaks and valleys are the same as when I was a kid. They sort of speak to me in a way. So I think it's safe to say for me, the boy who left these beautiful, rugged, sometimes treacherous mountains has had the mountains awakened 
in a man who has returned to a hillside farm. Thank you. So Ray, you, you actually experienced what it's really like to be a flatlander. You know, we, we have that expression right. for yeah. people here, yeah. but yeah. you lived where the land was flat and it didn't yeah. sit right with you. Yeah. So you right. had to come back. <laughs> Did you have any idea how hard it would be when you decided to, to revive your aunt's hillside oh, yes. farm? I knew before I moved here, it was going to be hard trying to scratch out a living, especially a living off the land here in rural Vermont. I knew that up front. I mean, I have still have family and relatives here, always been in contact with them. And No, I knew that. So you are a little crazy. I guess so, yeah, yeah. Have your friends come around? Uh, yes, I've actually had several of them, or a couple of them actually come out and visit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is the hardest thing about trying to return the land to agricultural productivity? I mean, like the actual physical hardest thing. Well, the, the first thing is like, you know, this farm really hasn't been farmed in 70 or so years, so everything has been played out. And in my mind, the first thing is to feed the soil. I went and aerated everything and um, I, I bought an old chopper and I actually took what was there as the material and chopped it right back on as some organic matter. So that, that took two years just to do that. But now the hay fields are starting to look pretty good and I've been fortunate that I've had neighbors to let me use their fields and and so that, that's been helpful. So you're farming hay right now? You're producing yep. hay. What else do you want to be producing? Well, with hopes of uh, beef cattle and lumber products eventually. Yep. I have a sawmill and want to get that online. Yep. How long? What's, what's your, I mean, is that like a five-year plan, 10-year? It was a three-year plan before I moved out here, and I'm probably in a <laughs> year and a half. Yeah, I get from my relatives, you got that sawmill going yet? <laughs> I'm, I'm curious if you have a vision that you could paint for us of what you think your farm, what you hope your farm will look like in 20 years. You know, if somebody came by 20 years from now, what would they see? Well, I'd hope to see they would see some new old-fashioned barns and something like the farm was taken care of so it could be passed on to the next generation. You have anybody in mind for that? Sort of, but uh, that depends on my kids, you know. <laughs> and, and that may not be, but it doesn't matter, you know. My I, intent was to make it so that it could be a productive type, sustainable farm with that much land. That's a problem, though, isn't it? I mean, figuring out what happens to the farm when you're too old to farm it? Oh, yeah. You know, and, yeah. and who gets it? And is yeah. it something your kids are going to want? Yeah. And yeah. how do you, I mean, how do you yeah. have those conversations? Well, you don't. You know, my kids are, <laughs> well, you do, but like I was talking to my daughter, I was going to be on this, and she goes, oh, you're a mountain man again. <laughs> and uh, so um, I go, well, I'm trying to do this that maybe you guys might want to take this over. She goes, well, don't think about me. But... <laughs> It, How old is she? She's 27. So, you know, as she gets older, possibly, and maybe not, you know, but that option will be there. You also said you don't want to see this patch of land that means something to you become just a bunch of cookie-cutter homes. Why mm -hmm. not? I mean, we, we know housing is an issue. Yeah. More people in Vermont is something a lot of people would like to see. That's true. But here's one of the issues. Vermont has only so much open land, and I think you have to use that land wisely. I saw this in Michigan where I lived. In a span of 15, 20 years that were all cornfields, within 20 years were strip malls along the highway. When you think about Vermont's uneasy balance with its land use planning and its working landscape, and there are a lot of ways that that tension plays out, whether it's through development rules or through, you know, questions of uh, sometimes new neighbors coming in, not really wanting to be near the farm. That's true. Yeah. Do you think we have the balance right, by and large? I, I think so. I mean, I've been fortunate enough to, you know, have friends in other states other than Michigan, too, that farmed. And, yeah, this state does have a, a fairly decent balance that way. 
But you said you notice it too, that not everybody wants, everybody wants to see the farm or wants to, to have the pastoral landscape, but not everybody wants to live right up next to it. That's something that, you've that's experienced. Right. That's right. That's very true. I experienced that in Michigan. Yeah. What, are, what are those interactions like? How do uh, you experience them Don't from spread your side? manure on a Sunday when, you're, when their daughter is having a graduation party. <laughs> Just for example. <laughs> and we were pretty far away, so I didn't spread manure that day. You didn't, see? Right. So you were a good neighbor. Right. Yeah. Well, Ray Hull, it's a, a pleasure to have you with us tonight, and I, I really, I'm pulling for your farm. I hope that Thank I you. can buy some beef from Thank you in you. a couple of years. Yes, Thank you very sure. much for being part of it. Ray Hull. Thank you very much. For our next guest, the decision about whether or not to live here and to stay here involves not just a job, not just a family, but a decision about what kind of place to raise a child in, what values to instill in your kid, but also how to keep them safe. You can't keep a kid completely safe. I think we all know that. But when you're a family of color, that calculation may feel different here in a state where more than 90% of the population identifies as white. Amber Wiley thinks about that calculation and why, when the pros and cons are considered, the balance is still in Vermont's favor. Amber Wiley, come on out to the stage. My name is Amber. My family moved to Vermont in 1973 when I was one. We settled in Sharon in an old, uninsulated farmhouse on the edge of the White River. I grew up with memories of barn raisings and contra dances and bartering sessions where we traded the bounty of our garden for the bounties of others' work. We found a community of people to whom community was important, and we helped each other when the winter was harsh. Life was governed by the rhythm of the seasons, from the boom, crack, and bellow of the river ice as it went out in the spring, to the river parties and tubing and squashing potato bugs in the summer. Watching the color spread across the mountains like slow fireworks in the autumn and hunkering down in the winter, knowing we had a long time to endure of cold and dark and snow. And through all of the seasons was the wood. My father and I split, stacked to dry, brought into the basement, stacked again, and then burned 13 cord of wood each year. <laughs> I've got broad shoulders. <laughs> but there's another side to Vermont. My father is European-American, mostly German, Irish, and English. My mother's ancestors are African, Caribbean, Seminole, and Irish. Life in rural Vermont as a minority is isolating and sometimes scary. There were places my family could not go. It was not safe. And I have memories of my European-American classmates saying things like, yeah, you can come to the party if you're willing to be snuck in the back, because my daddy hates you N-words. I remember people trying to tell me that it was impossible for my mother to be black because everybody knew that black people and white people cannot actually create living offspring. <laughs> I never learned how to respond to the taunts of the European Americans who told me, why don't you people just go back where you came from? How do you respond to that? How does a child respond to that? What I wish I could have said was, my ancestors have been here for over 12,000 years. I am where I come from. How about you? <laughs> but I couldn't say that. I was too afraid of what would happen if I spoke to the truth. I was afraid of what would happen next. 
So I left Vermont. I said I was never coming back. I was never going to split another piece of wood. I was never going to shovel any more snow. I was never going to live somewhere where I was made to feel like a freak just because I existed. I wanted ease. I wanted convenience. I went to Skidmore College in upstate New York. I married my best friend from high school. We moved to Halifax, Nova Scotia, Oxford, England, New York City. The combination of unbelievable coincidences, luck, and family need that brought me back to Vermont 20 years after I had left. It's astonishing. And I am well and truly back. I work in the school where my father was a tutor a mile and a half from the house I grew up in where my parents still live. I live in the town where my husband grew up, where his parents still live. I tell the students at my school, never say never. Life in rural Vermont is no joke. The racism is still here. It's different, a little less, but still here. The winters can kill you. <laughs> the grocery store is a 30-minute drive away, at least. My parents' frequent chemo appointments are 45 minutes away. Nothing is easy. Nothing is convenient. Finding a job is hard. The pay cut I took to move here is painful to think about. My husband works in New Jersey. It's a hustle. But we make it work. And the reason we make it work is because rising above all the difficulties, like the mountains that gave this state its name, is the beauty of this place. I don't have to pay a membership fee. I can just look out my window, walk out my door, Drive to work is breathtaking in any season. And coursing through everything, like the rivers in our valleys, are the connections. Connections to the land. I watch my food being grown. Connections to music. Living room concerts, free concerts on the town green, pub sings. Connections to art in our libraries, post offices. Connections to people. I can't go anywhere without running into someone I know, or their mother, or their uncle, or their kid. I get to know them as multidimensional beings. Nothing is easy. Nothing is convenient. But life is real, and life is good here. And yes, I do split wood again. <laughs> and I love to shovel. Thank you. Amber, you have a son, I think, is that right? And yes. does your son like to shovel snow and chop wood? Chop wood, <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> Shoveling snow, it depends. <laughs> you said there were places that you couldn't go when you were a kid, that yeah. your family couldn't go. The yeah. Tunbridge Fair was off limits. Yeah. Could you go now? Um, I go with my husband. He is European American. He is six foot eight. Um, and I feel safe. I have talked with the organizers of the Tunbridge Fair about um, some of the things that I've seen there, and I know that they take it very seriously. But you wouldn't go by yourself? I'm hesitant. And some of that is my memories. Um, it might be perfectly safe, but my memories are so strong. You say the racism is still here, and clearly that's true. Where and how do you experience it? Confederate flags all over the place. Um, people who say to me, what are you? Or um, if I stop to take a photograph and somebody says, where are you from? I'm from Stratford. No, where are you from? I grew up in Sharon. You don't look like you grew up in Sharon. It's everywhere. You never know when somebody's going to say something. Um, and those are just my experiences. The experiences of other minorities are far more violent sometimes. Um, we all, yeah, it's, it's still here. And yet you look at that ledger and 
you know, it's still, in some ways at least, comes out in Vermont's favor. You know, you talk eloquently about what you love about Vermont. The space, music, God, connection, art, the cold, even chopping wood. Does it make it all worth it? I think so. I think that's why I'm here. Um, it doesn't negate the difficulties. Um, but there's a community here, and there's a way to access that community, and there's a way to make a difference here that isn't always possible other places. Why do you think it's not possible other places? Or more possible here? Part of it is the size. I think part of it is really about getting to know people. If I, when I, um, when I lived in the New York City area, I saw my colleagues at work, I saw church friends at church. I saw neighbors in the neighborhood. And I didn't get to see all the different aspects of those same people. And here, all of those people are all over. I see them at work. I see them at a swimming hole. I see them with their kids. I see them taking care of their parents. It's they are, we all know each other on a much deeper level. And when you have those relationships and those connections, that's where transformation, change can happen. That's where you can really help each other. You mentioned the art and music you experience here. And you, know, you also said you've lived in New York, you've lived other places where there, there are world-class musicians, there are world-class galleries. You can see something any night of the week. What is it about the art and music here that fills you so much? You can access it. Um, so I'm a photographer. I don't have to have exhibited at a fancy museum. I can exhibit at my post office. I can access that level of, of artistic expression. And I can see it with people I know. It's that, it's, again, it's that, that multidimensionality. Um, so it's not as removed as it can be in bigger places. Um, I, can, I can get on stage and sing with friends. I don't have to be a Broadway star. Um, Good, because I was going to say, are you ready? No. <laughs> <laughs> when you were younger, you said you were never coming back. Never. And obviously you did. One of the questions that we asked people in our rural life survey was, would they advise an 18-year-old today to stay in the state or leave? And you know, from my perspective, that question is really nuanced in some ways that you can't get into in a survey because you might live anywhere and tell an 18-year-old, go away for a while, you need it, then come back. But I'm curious you know, how you would talk to your son. Do you hope he stays here? Do you want him to, to keep these roots? How would you advise him on that question? Well, one thing we, we do tell him already is leave the country. Um, it is so important to leave the country because if you can, if you're lucky enough, we were, we were very lucky, um, because that's when you get to look at all of your assumptions and your, um, your beliefs from a completely different perspective. And then you can reassemble your assumptions and beliefs in a deliberate way. So, I think it's really important for people to see other ways of being. And I also think it's important, we're here by choice now, which is very different than feeling trapped, which means I bring a different energy to being here and I take advantage of things in a different way because I'm choosing to be here now. I think whether people stay or go is a very individual thing. Some people need to leave in order to appreciate what they have. Some people already know what they have. It depends on the person. Amber, how do you use your own experiences, your sense of community and sense of home and the places that you've lived elsewhere and what you've experienced being a person of color in Vermont to help guide students in your job at Sharon Academy? There are lots of, of things that I try to do. Um, I try to be a safe place. Um, I think it's really important for schools especially to have many different types of minorities on staff so that when the students 
have questions or are feeling marginalized, they know they can talk to someone who understands what it's like. Likewise, European American students also need to be able to see people of different backgrounds and, and everything. <laughs> Because if you're going to be a leader and if you're going to go out there in the world, this is not what the world looks like. The world looks very, very different, and you need to be able to accept that. Do you think it's important for Vermonters who identify as white or European American? I mean, you're, you're very consciously using that term. Is that because there's this othering of other people and a default about being white that you're yes. trying to highlight? And it's because I have, I have had conversations with European Americans who seem to have forgotten that they are immigrants. That they may have only been here for a couple of generations, maybe three generations. We are a country of immigrants and refugees. And we can't forget that. So yes, I'm using European American very specifically. If I'm African American and European American, then European American is another part of it. The older you get, are you still as enamored of the cold as you were <laughs> as a child? I mean, is that something you still really love about living in Vermont? Well, the nice thing is that I have warmer clothes now. <laughs> <laughs> that helps. It does. Amber Wiley, thank you very much for being a part of this evening and sharing your story. We have one last storyteller for you tonight. Bill McGrath has had a couple of opportunities to leave Vermont, and he took the first one when he was younger. That landed him in New York, but obviously he did come back. More recently, he had the chance to move the manufacturing company he leads from here in Randolph to another state. The decision about whether or not to go affected not just him, but about 60 people who work for the company. In the end, Bill decided to keep his company here. It was a choice that had both an upside and a downside. Please welcome Bill McGrath. My parents were raised in New York. So despite being born and raised here in Vermont, according to the real Vermonter rules, the best I can hope to achieve is the status of flatlander once removed. My mother had a cousin in Barnard, and her and my dad used to come up and visit them quite a bit when they first got married. Eventually, they decided to have a family here in Vermont. They moved to Underhill, Vermont, and I came along. They gave me a chance to get a start in Vermont, but would I stay in Vermont or to leave and go to the city? I loved electricity as far back as I can remember, getting yelled at for turning the light switch on and off, on and off. I loved electronics, and I would take things apart to see how they worked. I was fascinated by radio and television and the miracle of wireless communication. How did this little box, attached to nothing, play music and information and entertainment? How did this TV screen, only plugged into the wall, show these pictures from all over the world, including Sesame Street? I asked my mom where these signals came from, and she pointed out in our backyard to the towers up there on Mount Mansfield, which we could clearly see. I thought everybody could see the towers from their backyard. <laughs> After high school, I went to the University of Bridgeport in Connecticut. I was immersed in city life. I wanted to learn electronics, but that first year was all English and math and history. I got bored and tapped into an antenna in my dormitory building and created a TV station for all the residents that lived there. <laughs> we played movies at night, we had a bulletin board during the day, and of course featured the college's radio station, which of course I was heavily involved with. <clears throat> it was fun, more fun than going to class. A girl in my dorm told her father about my television station invention, and since he worked for a major television network in New York City, he offered me a job. Next thing I know, I was on the set of a major evening newscast, uh, keeping all those little monitors behind the anchor working and showing things that were appropriate. 
Forget college. I found a different way to have a career. One day, when I came to visit my parents, I was thinking about how in New York I was living in a very expensive tiny room and how this was a very big space and it looked a little different than I remembered when I left it. It looked pretty nice. And so I thought, okay, let me look for a job in Vermont. And even though the pay was going to be a lot less, my quality of life would be better. I got a job at a local TV station in Burlington. And all of a sudden, I was driving and snowmobiling and riding a snowcat up to those same towers I'd seen as a child. I loved that job. I became an amateur radio operator, a volunteer firefighter, an EMT. But I kind of felt like something was missing. Like, I didn't have that college degree, and I could see how that would eventually impair my career path. So, I heard about VTC having this new four-year degree program and decided to quit it all and go there, as a non-traditional student, they call me. With an adult mind, I engaged in my classes. I was able to still get good grades while doing the fun things like college radio stations and building electric cars and other clubs. I was an RA and became a residence director. I was, started teaching classes while I was still enrolled. And I got elected as a student representative for the Vermont State College Board of Trustees. So I was simultaneously a student, staff member, faculty member, and a trustee on the board. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like taking the cover off an ant jar. I could see everybody's plight, and it was really clear to me why they were all frustrated with high tuitions and low pay and not enough support from our state for higher education. I tried to improve things the best I could. And I thought I might just teach there at the college for the rest of my life. It seemed like summer's off, right? <clears throat> Work through the winters. Well, some fellows were starting a company to address a new emerging technology. Light emitting diodes had just crossed this big barrier where the blue LED was invented, and that, of course, gave way to the white LED. And I instantly knew that this is possibly going to replace all forms of conventional lighting with a lot more energy efficient choices. I knew some great minds from VTC, and so I was able to get them to join me and form a company called LED Dynamics right here in Randolph. We grew in spurts and we had setbacks as companies do. Eventually we outgrew our space and we had to make a decision. New York was offering us 10 free years of rent if we would relocate there. New Hampshire had low minimum wage, tax incentives, and plenty of space. And even our advisors were saying that either one of those locations would offer us more opportunities because we'd be close to established tech centers. If we were going to stay in Vermont, we'd have to have a new facility because there wasn't anything existing around that would meet our needs. And that's an expensive proposition to build in Vermont. So, I contacted the state with my plight and said, I can't make this financially justifiable to stay in Vermont, but I really want to try. And they responded. And we were able to get just enough help to be able to build our factory, which opened in June here in Randolph, keeping those jobs here. So now, I'm able to make a living, create meaningful jobs, Environment, environmentally friendly products right here in Randolph. And it's just a great thing to do. But also, if I want to go to the city, three hours I can be in Montreal or Boston, right? I get to hike, I can camp, I can snowmobile, and I can even go see a mountain in my backyard. So Vermont's the place for me. Thank you. <laughs> So as you said, your company, LED Dynamics, started in a farmhouse over the hill in Rochester yes, and moved to Randolph. You've had these opportunities to go other places, thought about moving out of state. Can you go a little deeper into the pros and cons that you weighed in, in making that decision to stay here? Because it's not one that comes easy. Yeah, and uh, you know, the story remains to be told about whether that was a good idea or not. But um, certainly, I'm very happy about the opportunity to give that a try. And we, we certainly had, you know, 
a lot of times in the history of the company, especially starting in a little farmhouse in Rochester, um, been told, you know, why aren't you in Silicon Valley or Boston or someplace where this is expected? But we continue to surprise people. We were one of the first ones to create patents for this technology. Um, we were constantly innovating, and we even made some of the big players really mad because they were like, these guys are in, a, you know, a muddy parking lot in Vermont, and they're <laughs> out innovating you. So that's, that's kind of what we did. Do you like being the leader of a company? Do you like running a company? I mean, it's a far cry from tinkering in your bedroom. Um, I like to think that there's a whole team behind me, and uh, I'm just lucky enough that there's enough of a, a team that I'm able to be the spokesperson sometime. But. I don't know if that means you like it or not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Carefully worded. <laughs> you know, we often hear about tech companies really struggling to find good employees, and that's something that in Vermont especially is an issue that lawmakers talk about, governors, successive governors have talked about, how to, how to sort of get schools to work to the skills that employers need, not necessarily have children and, and young people coming up into skills that then there are no jobs for. Do you have trouble finding the employees you need here? Well, first of all, you know, we have um, a great local base to pull from for workers, and, uh, but the, the best trick in the book is that we have VTC as the wellspring to be able to bring even more great minds. And some of the folks on my team go back up there to teach and then when we figure out, you know, who the best folks are, we might skim them off the top, so. <laughs> but it's, it's, you know, hopefully what came out in my story was that not just the company, but my love for the college and the opportunity it presented. I mean, I had been out there, and when I got there, I just realized I was, this is what I was meant to be, and I still feel very strongly that connection is what's going to empower us to continue to have a good um, stream of folks coming in with great jobs. I, the hardest part is honestly that, other folks that have tasted VTC graduates are, they get addicted quickly and we have to compete with them, so. You mentioned that you were a sort of non-traditional student. You were older yes, than I heard some that of the term. other students. Yeah, <clears throat> you know, that, that's an intimidating thing for a lot of people who either didn't get a degree or would like to get a different kind of degree or see a path to a different career, but that goes through a college setting and that can be daunting in many ways. Do you have advice for other adults who are you know, trying to pursue this path and thinking college might be the way to go. Yeah, get over it. I mean, higher education is everything. I mean, if you can, if you can possibly take advantage of it. I mean, it didn't really occur to me until I suddenly was there and realized, wait, I'm a few years older than these folks. And the admissions guy called me a non-traditional student. I said, well, what does that mean? But okay, I'll wear it. And instead, I ended up being, you know, a lot of ways a role model for those folks, which really made up for my my earlier uh, forget college statement. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose it doesn't mean that you're not allowed to play beer pong, though, even if you're Oh, no, no. Older. In fact, we're the only ones legally allowed to play. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of volunteer fire departments and emergency rescue squads are really strustruggling to fill their ranks right now. And there's a, a lot of conversation about whether and how to quote unquote professionalize the ranks or how to make sure that there are emergency services in small communities and that's happening around the state. I mean, how do we fix that problem? Well, you know, this kind of ties into another slide I think I saw during the show, before the show here where, you know, we want childcare folks to be professionals. We want these emergency folks to be professionals. It was starting when I was joining and we had to go through the training, which I think was a lot better than the, the older smoke eaters. But on the other side of the coin, if you ask too much, these are volunteers. You know, and so now we're being required to do things like the, because of insurance reasons, we have to become employees of the, the town. It just becomes very, very difficult to run a club or anything like that when it comes to the, the amount of time that you have to spend with administrative overhead and training that may or may not be relevant. Too much regulation in this state? Um, it's something we should be very careful of. Again, very carefully worded. You and our first storyteller, Morgan, have share in common this, um, this position that you've held on the State Board of Trustees. That's pretty cool that you're both, yeah. you know, that you've both at different stages of your life and in different ways come to this realization that for both of you, this has been a really important part of your life and your development. Yeah, and it wasn't an easy task to, you know, suddenly be thrust under the corporate board of a corporation. I mean, it, you know, takes you totally by a different dimension than what you're used to from the other perspectives, but I could see from everybody's perspective why they were all frustrated. They all wanted the best for the system, and, and uh, you know, 
it's just a tough situation. Bill, you're our last storyteller, so you get the honor of helping to wrap everything up. And and you, I, you know, I, you've heard all of your fellow storytellers practicing and thinking about what they wanted to say tonight and how their stories help illuminate some of the issues that we see in Vermont. From what you've heard, and and all five of you have very different stories, but a lot of through lines as well. Are you optimistic about the future of the state? Do you see things happening in these stories of people here that give you hope? about who we are and where we're going? Yeah, I mean, I think that we, um, we hear the struggle with our population, and aging population, things like that, but I think we um, have a lot of opportunities if we um, keep up the fight to, to keep Vermont, uh, you know, both with the general stores that we need to try to preserve if possible. I, mean, I know that I try to give a lot back to the traditional ways and learn from the folks, even I'm, I'm only going to be a you know, Flatlander once removed, but I would like to learn as much about Vermont as I can. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I think the most important thing is that we realize going forward, it's really us that make Vermont. Well, Bill McGrath, thank you very much for being a part of this evening and for sharing your story with us. Thanks a lot. You know, Bill's story brings us to a nice conclusion this evening, as we think about all of the ways that Vermont experiences the pushes and pulls of the modern world, the need for innovation, but also a connection to the past and to the values that really sustain our sense of self here. We're going to have to figure out, as Vermonters, which values are worth preserving and which are going to have to adjust, maybe have already adjusted, so that we can have a fair and equitable society for everyone who calls themselves a Vermonter. As we heard tonight from all five of our storytellers, life can be really hard here. But even when it's hard, for many people, and certainly for those on stage tonight, it's still worth staying, digging in, and being a part of the solutions for our communities. I want to thank our brave storytellers for joining us this evening and sharing their lives with us. Please join me in thanking them with your applause.